morning and welcome to Volva Kral Nature Reserve. This is a small nature reserve only three kilometers from the village of Prince Albert. We bought it in 2005 specially to protect a very rare succulent plant, Valia dilatata. However, it's proved a very valuable asset for student training. I'll tell you something now about the neighbors of the reserve and what they offer in terms of research opportunities. And I'll tell you also about the geology, the flora, the fauna, and what research opportunities are available now and may become available in the future. To start off, the reserve lies between the municipal waste disposal sites, both the solid and liquid waste disposal sites, a farming community, mainly sheep farmers, and a housing estate. So these three types of neighbours have different impacts on the nature reserve. The effluent from the sewage works and the solid waste disposal move onto this property by wind and also by water. Through the centre of the reserve runs quite a major river, the Dorps River, which comes from the Swartberg mountain and supplies all the water for the village. It's beautiful clear mountain water, but unfortunately most of the time 100% of that water is used by the village for irrigation and household use. And that means that when the river arrives at Volva Kral Nature Reserve, most of the time it's completely dry, except after heavy rainfall when it floods. And during these floods, it unfortunately carries garbage from the solid waste disposal site, which is only a few meters from the edge of the river. So there's an opportunity there to look at human impacts on a nature reserve. And in fact, FTON, or the Extended Freshwater and Terrestrial Observation Network, will shortly be setting up a flux tower in this area to measure impacts of human settlement on the air of the natural environment here. So they will presumably measure dust, carbon dioxide and smoke inputs from the nearby village. There's opportunities to look at plastic movement and water pollution into the natural environment, both via wind, water and animal movement. Now let me tell you something about the geology and soils of the reserve because this gives rise to a very diverse vegetation. The reserve, although very small, has about a hundred meters rise across its two kilometer extent. The rise is an Eka mudstone kopi and this descends down onto plains which in places are windblown sand, in places are Eka mudstone and in places are alluvium carried out of the river. The river 15,000 years ago deposited river rolled pebbles after the last glacial maximum and this creates perfect habitat for rare small succulent plants. Because of the varied soils and geology of this area, one finds areas dominated by stipogrostis, desert grasses, areas dominated purely by succulents, and then much more Namakuru type vegetation on the exposed Eka mudstones. The grazing history of the nature reserve is also quite interesting. If you look at the felt behind me, you'll see it's extremely degraded. It presumably was once used for sheep grazing at a very high intensity, possibly early on in the history of European settlement. It is enclosed in this part of the reserve by a very old hand-built stone wall. We are trying various methods to restore this part of the nature reserve using mini catchments and reseeding and have to date been quite unsuccessful. The rest of the nature reserve has been moderately grazed over time and for the last 45 years there have been no domestic livestock here whatsoever. Only small games such as Steenbuk and Dyke. So the reserve is in better condition or was in better condition than the surrounding farms prior to the drought that started here in 2015. 
as you continue this tour with me, we will show you some of the effects that the drought has had on the vegetation. It, the drought effects varied considerably between species and I'll be pointing that out later. So all in all, welcome again to the Nature Reserve and you can see that there are tremendous opportunities both for sociological research and ecological research and those who are interested in soils, pollutant spread and geology will also find lots of opportunities here. Thanks. One of Volvacral's boundaries is shared with the municipality, as you can see. And on the other side of the fence is the liquid and solid waste disposal sites. This is a great opportunity for people interested in pollution studies. The solid waste blows over the fence and into the nature reserve, but it's also brought into the nature reserve by mammals that forage on the garbage and consume food out of plastic bags, often swallowing plastic bags. And in this way, they bring plastic in, in their feces and distribute it in the nature reserve. So anyone interested in the plastic decomposition cycle would have great opportunities to follow plastics from the village into the natural environment working here. Here's a yellow mongoose midden and you can see all the feces here and at least one, two, three, four of the bits of feces contain plastic bags. Here we are at a restoration experiment that we set up in 2017. This experiment is an attempt to get vegetation back on extremely shallow soil, skeletal soil, on bare ground. We're not sure what caused the loss of vegetation, but possibly a combination of grazing and removing surface stones in order to build a wall. So there were very few traps for seeds here and for probably more than 50 years this ground has been bare. We brought in a team of 25 enthusiastic BTEC students from Sarsfeld Nature Conservation in 2017 and for three days they dug these dummikis or mini catchment sites to catch runoff water. They placed mulch or a mixture of sticks into the holes and we sowed seed over the whole site. In some places they built little retaining catchment walls from tamarisk, an invasive alien shrub cut in the riverbed, and in other places they packed brush, mainly acacia karoo branches, as you can see here. So what we were trying to find out is what works better for getting plants back onto skeletal soils. Is it water catchments or is it brush packing or would perhaps a combination of brush packing and catchments work best? And what you can see here is very little vegetation has established at all because since 2017 when we did all this work we have had this drought and some years we had rainfall as little as 50 millimeters for the whole year. Nevertheless you can see that each of these dummikis has one or two little grass plants. Most of them have a Senchrociliaris or blow biffelgras and this is the plant that we seeded into the dummikis so that is quite encouraging. Moreover, the mulch and little dams have caught seeds blown by the wind and they've also attracted hares which are grazing the grasses and they leave behind their droppings which we assume contain seeds of both grasses and annual plants. So we have had what I could call very limited success. The first results are brush packing alone was not successful. The denser the brush packing was, the least successful it was because seeds cannot enter the brush packed area and combination of brush packing and dams which we imagined would be the best in fact was no better than dummikis or hollows alone. Here we are at the 2016 restoration trials. These trials were carried out on deep alluvial sand and the erosion appears to have been caused by heavy grazing combined with wind erosion. 
Here we again had a group of 25 Sarsfeld students and their travel here and the three days they spent camping and eating was funded by the Missouri Botanical Garden. So the students dug these large dummies about a metre across and put sticks in them which would act as perches for birds in the hope of bringing in additional plant species. This trial, in my opinion, has been very successful. We sowed Stipogrostis, Sencris, Osteospermum, and Salsula, a filler, Hanabos. And as you can see, in a single dummy, all these species have been represented. All are strongly growing and all have already flowered after five years. Moreover, the hares come into the dummies to browse the plants and they leave behind droppings, which probably also have seeds in them. The drought in this part of the Karoo started in about beginning of 2015 and it persisted into 2020. That was the worst year of all. We only received 50 millimeters of rain here that year. This year seems slightly better. We've had 70. During that period, a number of students carried out line intercept sampling of the vegetation to try and understand which plant species were most vulnerable to drought and which died back most. What we found is that it was very surprising our finding, Tyronia palins, also known as scorspors, which is a poisonous shrub that increases under grazing because sheep don't eat it and lives at least a hundred years, strangely enough suffered one of the highest rates of mortality during this drought. So let me point out to you a scorspors. This is a school spouse. This one is half dead, but if you look around the landscape, you'll see that many of them are just now grey skeletons, completely dead. They won't re-sprout, even given heavy rainfall. Their seeds have a very short lifespan, perhaps a year or 18 months, so it's unlikely that they come back from seed either. So this should be good news for overgrazed farms because instead of being dominated by a poisonous plant, they're now dominated by dead plants and this provides an opportunity for restoration. If a source of seeds of palatable plants is available, then palatable plants should germinate from seed in the next heavy rains. However, if there's no seed source, then we don't know what will happen on farms where large quantities of poisonous plants have died back. Will the felt deteriorate or will it get worse? The felt we're looking at here on Volvacral Nature Reserve has been ungrazed for 45 years by domestic livestock. There are just a few Steenbockies and Dyker here. And you'll notice during that period of rest, a number of grasses and a high diversity of shrubs has established and many of them survived through the drought, although there was dieback here too. About 40% of all shrubs have died. On the other side of the fence, there's a, t a sheep farm and there you can see heavy dieback in the Tyronia palins and what replaced it after the light March rains we had interestingly enough was the pioneer that we call Forstreis drova or Augia capensis. This pioneer plant has a lifespan of about three years and collects salt in its leaves and for this reason is unpalatable to sheep. So an unpalatable poisonous long-lived plant in this case has been been replaced by a short-lived unpalatable plant. We have no idea how the felt will change over the next few decades. This bare area is a cocoon sheep kraal, probably abandoned about 250 years ago, between 1770 and 1800. And still today it is completely bare of plants. The reason is that the wind and the water here blows and flows away any seed that fall, falls on this hardened surface. So how this kraal became so bare is that the sheep contained here by a thorn branch surround would have trampled on all the plants as they were crawled here at night and also broken up the lichens in the soil crust. This means that the soil became extremely loose and friable and was washed down to the river 
by heavy rains or blown away by the almost constant wind in this area. It's a warning to us all that when we disturb these very arid parts of the Karoo, recovery isn't automatic. It isn't passive. We have to do something to bring the plants back to bare areas. Otherwise, erosion will simply continue to damage the felt further. Now we're standing in the bed of the Dorps River. This is one of the biggest rivers in the Prince Albert area. It runs out of the Swartberg Mountains and it supplies 100% of the drinking and irrigation water for the village. You wouldn't think so if you looked at it here where we're standing below the village. The reason is that the drought since 2014 has reduced the amount of fresh water running out of the Swartberg Mountain and also because the population the population of the village has grown and so that water use is more than it used to be some years ago. When we bought this property in 2005, the river used to flow for three or four months at a time, sometimes even nine months of the year. But since 2014, it has been totally dry, except for occasional flash floods lasting for a few hours. As you can see, the vegetation on either side of the river is very dry looking and many of the sweet thorns Acacia Karoo have died during the drought. So at Drini Karoo we do um, seeds in, in um, large scale. We harvest the seeds and that usually goes to farmers or people restoring the felt. Um, so there's a lot of research opportunities with seed dormancy, um, especially with Bushman's grasses, your Stipogrossus species. Um, we usually get students, nature conservation students, and they mostly help us with, with trials. Um, and apart from the seed business, we also do felt plants, succulents, um, normal shrubs, and we mostly focus on Jardari Karoo shrubs.